Just introduce myself, who I am? Yes. Sure. Hey, I'm Pastor David. I'm one of the pastors here at Crosswinds. I'm teaching Financial Peace University. Why do I need financial peace? You ever had student loans, medical debts, debts to the IRS? car loans, credit cards. Have you ever had personal loans with other people? Have you ever had your debt in collections? I've had all of that. And it really just makes our life miserable. Well, it did. Uh, my wife and I fought every week. Financial peace gives you the desire to finally live the way God intended you to live in freedom. If you want to get out of debt, if you don't have a plan for your life, if you don't know how to give, if you don't know, if you don't know how to plan for your future, this is for you. We are here to encourage you, inspire you, coach you, influence you in any way we can to help you live your financial peace. I want you to join me and Pastor Becky on Sundays at 11 o'clock in room five. We're going to inspire hope into your life. We want you to have financial peace for you and everyone that you influence. You're gonna be great givers. You're also going to be able to live generously and you're gonna live and give like no one has ever before. So come and be encouraged, be hopeful that God has great things in store for you. Hey, Crosswinds Church Online. My name is Jordan. I'm the youth pastor here at Crosswinds and it's great to see you today. I'm glad you're with us. I'm glad you tuned in. Hey, Pastor Pete is not with us. He's on vacation, but I'm glad to be able to share the word with you. So, you know what? I believe that this is going to be a great year. Not because we're not going to have any problems or everything's going to be perfect. We're just going to sail along, but because God is on the throne and he is the strength of our lives. The same God that has the power over all creation and the same God that rose Jesus from the dead lives within us. So we're going to stir ourselves up today. We're going to seize the moment that God has in store for us this year. Because I believe that we were created for such a time as this, that you were created for this moment in history. God wants to use you. God wants to use you to advance his kingdom right now. So on April 23rd, 2019, in Nepal, a mountaineer named Nims Persia arrived back at base camp after summiting the deadliest mountain in the world. It's called Annapurna. Annapurna is one of the 14 mountains in the world over 8,000 meters, and Nims and his team had just began a mission to summit all of these mountains in a seven-month span, setting a new world record. You see, most people don't summit any of these mountains in their life, and let alone not 14 of them, but they said, you know what, we're going to do them all in seven months. So standing there at base camp, exhausted, after he and his team had summited and came back down, all of a sudden, they got a call over the radio. Nims! Somebody's stuck on the mountain. There's another climber stuck on the mountain. Can you do anything? Can you guys go back up? And so as night approached, Nims and his team had a decision to make. Do they risk their lives to save the other climber? Or do they safeguard theirs and leave him to his fate? Let's just put ourselves in Nims' shoes for a moment. He had just summited the deadliest mountain in the world. It has a 33% fatality rate. That means one in three people who climb this mountain die. And he says, oh man, now I'm being asked to go back up that mountain. And not only that, but they had just began a mission to summit 14 of these mountains in a seven month time period. That's a big risk. And you may be thinking, there's no way, there's no way he's going to go back up that mountain. But you know what? With no hesitation, Nims and his team, they decided to do it. They put on harnesses and a helicopter came with a tow rope and it lowered it down and they clipped in to this tow rope from the helicopter and one by one, it lifted them up onto the mountain, up onto this ridge, as high as the helicopter could get them to where they thought that the climber was, and they set off in a search party at night. And ultimately, they saved this climber's life. I watched this documentary last month and I was so inspired. When he was asked why he did it, Nim said, I don't leave people behind. It's not in my blood. And if I were on that mountain, I'd want someone to come get me too. You see, in that moment of decision, Nims reminded himself of who he was, and he put the other climber's needs above his own. He stirred himself up, and he seized the moment that was presented to him. There was no guarantee of safety for him and his team, but there was the guarantee that if he didn't go, the other climber would perish. You see, this reminds me of our lives as Christians. Every day, we're presented with moments and opportunities like this. 
People are stuck on the mountain. They're stuck in a dire situation. Somebody needs encouragement or they're depressed or someone can't pay their bills or they need healing. They need a brother or a sister to come alongside them. And it's like the Holy Spirit is sending us the distress signal. It's saying, David, will you come in? Sandy, are you there? Daniel, come in. Are you with us? Will you go up the mountain? Will you help? Will you clip into the Holy Spirit? That's what I'm asking you today. That's what I'm asking myself. Will we clip in to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to take us up on the mountain on a rescue mission? Will you stir yourself up? Will you seize the moment that awaits you? Today, we're going to look at three ways that we can stir ourselves up. Number one, we have to know who we are. Nehemiah Chapter 6 is where we're going to go, and just to give you a little bit of context, Nehemiah was an Israelite who was living in Persia. He was the cupbearer to the Persian king, very important position, but he heard that back in Jerusalem, his homeland, the city of Jerusalem, the walls had been torn down. They were crumbled, and he said, ah, I can't allow the walls of Jerusalem to be crumbled, to be in a desolate state and do nothing. So Nehemiah asked the king, hey, king, can I go back? Can I go back to my homeland? Can I rebuild the walls? And the king said, yes, Nehemiah, you can go. So as Nehemiah was on this mission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he was continually opposed by enemies, and their names were Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And they did everything they could to try and keep him from completing his mission of rebuilding the walls. They tried to lure him into ambush. They tried to blackmail him. They tried to use fear tactics. They tried to draw him out so that they could kill him. Over and over again, they tried to stop him from rebuilding the walls. So that's where we pick up this story. As he's doing this mission, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10, it says, When I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was, content, who was confined at home, he said, let's meet together in the house of God within the temple and let's close the doors to the temple for they are coming to kill you and they're coming to kill you at night. But I said, should a man like me flee? Who was there like me who would go into the temple to save his own life? I will not go in. And then I realized that God certainly had not sent him. But he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. You see, Shemaiah was being used by the enemy to try and get Nehemiah to hide in fear and to ruin his reputation. You see, the enemy will try to bring fear into our lives. He will try and paralyze us and put us into a place of hiding, a place of doubt, a place of closing everyone off and isolating ourselves and shutting out the world to say, ah, you know what? You can't seize the moment you're in. You can't complete your mission. You need to get into comfort mode. You need to surround yourself with all these walls and doors and close yourself off because guess what? You can't seize the moment. But you know what? Nehemiah, he was able to overcome because he responded out of his identity. He says, I know who I am. I'm not a man who goes to the house of the Lord to hide. I'm a stirred up man of God. I'm on a mission. I'm doing a great work for the Lord and I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to seize the moment that God has created me for. You see, Nehemiah, he didn't even think twice. He said, wait, wait, wait. You want me to do what? You want me to go hide? Just go into the house of the Lord and hide? Are you crazy? Like, do you know who I am? Do you know my name? My name is Nehemiah. My name actually means comforted by God. And when you're comforted by God, you can't be kept in fear by the enemy. Listen, God has given each one of us a Nehemiah mission. We live in a time where many people are broken down, just like those walls of Jerusalem. People are broken. Systems are broken. Things are broken in our world. But God is asking us to rebuild the walls of people's lives. He's asking us to rebuild the walls of our communities, of our jobs, of our families. Here's what I want to say to you. Don't let the whispers of the enemy keep you back. Don't hide. Don't isolate yourself. Don't live in fear. Be secure in your identity and complete the mission that God has given to you. Stir yourself up. Seize the moment. Remind yourself who you are in Christ. Number two, in order to seize the moment and stir ourselves up, we have to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. We're going to talk about David in 1 Samuel chapter 30, but 
Here's where David was at in his life. He had been pursued and persecuted by Saul, the king who he once served. Saul got jealous. He said, you know what? We got to kill David. I don't like David anymore. So David is on the run. And David has this crew of people that comes around him. It says all the destitute people, all the people who had problems or who had issues in their life, they surrounded themselves around David. And David turned these men into great warriors. And he adopted their families. And he began to lead this group of men against the enemies of Israel. They would go out and they would raid the enemies of Israel. They would go on these missions. And during this time, he inherited a city called Ziklag. And so one day, as he's out raiding the enemies of Israel, they're on their way back to Ziklag. And they look off in the distance and they see some smoke rising in the air. They say, hey, what's going on over there? That looks like it's coming from home. And they get closer and they realize it's their own city. It's Ziklag. It's burning. You see, as they were out raiding their enemies, they had another enemy called the Amalekites who had come in. It had burned their city to the ground. It had taken away their families, their children, their wives, their livestock, their possessions. Everything was gone. The whole city was desolate. And that's where we pick up 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. It says, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people, his own men, spoke of stoning him. And all the souls of the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Now imagine you're David facing the situation. It feels like pure devastation. And then your own men, the own one that, that you trained up, the, the people that you took around you and that you strengthened, they're talking about killing you, about stoning you. Now talk about feeling overwhelmed. I mean, this is almost an impossible situation to overcome if we put ourselves in his shoes. But David is able to get past this overwhelming moment. And how does he do it? His success comes when he detaches himself from the emotion of the situation and he strengthens himself in the Lord. He remembers God, all the victories that he's given him. He's like, oh, God, I know you got an answer because before I even slew Goliath, you helped me defeat lions and you helped me def defeat bears. And then when I faced a 10 foot tall giant as a little boy, you helped me kill him with the sling. And then after that, in the armies of Israel, you helped me to kill thousands and thousands of my enemies. So God, I'm going to strengthen myself in you. Although the situation seems desolate, although everything seems lost, I'm going to strengthen myself in you. So David is able to strengthen himself in the Lord. And so we're going to pick it back up here in verse 7. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? Will I overtake them? And he, God, answered him and said, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. You see, David doesn't phone a friend. David doesn't Google, what should I do in this situation? David doesn't look for Facebook recommendations. David doesn't inquire of any man. When we face a situation like this, the best thing that we can do is what? Seek God. So David, he's able to detach himself from the emotion. He's able to seek God. And then from there, he's able to act. And when he does, the outcome is victory. You see, because the Amalekites... They were not that far away. And the children and the wives and the possessions, they were all still intact. Everybody was still alive. So David sets out with his men. He's able to overcome the enemy and he's able to actually save the life of every single person that was captured. He's able to gain back all of their livestock, all of their possessions. Everything is restored. Now, David's men had been grieving as if the case was closed, as if their families were already dead. And imagine what, have, what would have happened if David hadn't strengthened himself in the Lord. Their families probably would have died. David probably would have been stoned. But it took one man to pull himself out of that moment, out of the emotion of that moment, to strengthen himself in the Lord and to seek God. And he was able to recover everything. Listen, God is looking for people right now who can pull themselves out of the emotionally charged moments that we are in. 
It's not the reality that nothing will ever affect us, but it's that if we can detach ourselves from the emotion and seek God and strengthen ourselves, then we can seize the moments that we're in, the moments that we're living in, and say, Lord, I remember who you are. And although I see things that bother me, I'm going to separate myself from that and say, God, you still have a plan. God, you're still the God who was for me and not against me. And what is your plan? What are you calling me to do in this moment? And God has the answer. Number three, if we want to seize the moment, and stir ourselves up, we have to gather together. We're gonna fast forward to the New Testament now, to the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews gives us some great instructions. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 24, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is drawing nearer than ever before. Hey, we can all agree that we're living in unprecedented times. And as we see things happening in the world, we can't shrink back. We need to gather together and lean into the Spirit. You see, maybe you're watching online and saying, well, I can't gather together. I can't make it to a church service, to the physical church, or maybe you don't even live here in Sparks or in Reno but you can still gather together with another believer. It's not about the the number of believers, but it's about just gathering, the act of gathering. You can gather with your spouse. You can gather with your children. You can gather your family, or you can gather with your coworkers. You see, because Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. You can gather together. You can build somebody up. You can be built up by another person. I'm going to take you back to Nims. Remember Nims, the guy who climbed Annapurna? He set out on a mission to climb all 14 mountains in a seven-month time period. I'm going to tell you what happened. He did it. He achieved it. He did it in faster than the seven months. All 14 mountains, more than 8,000 peaks. He completed his mission. But here's the key. He had a team. He had a team. He gathered together with fellow climbers, and that was the key to his success. He said, hey, I got to have people that I can trust who will go up, who will set that rope, who will set that climbing route, or I have to have people who I can help up along the way. I need somebody to carry the oxygen tanks. I need somebody to help guide me, and I need to help guide someone else. I have to do it with the team. You see, Nims, he didn't try to do this alone. He knew he would need other people. And it's the same with us. If we're going to seize the moment, and we're going to stir ourselves up and seize the moment we're in, if we're going to fulfill our God-given purpose, we need each other. We need other believers. I need you, and you need me, and we need each other. So let's do it together. We're going to wrap it up with this. How do I stir someone up? You may be saying, hey, yeah, I'm ready. Like, I want to stir somebody up, but I don't know how to do it. You have to use the prophetic voice. Our final scripture is going to be 2 Timothy, and this is Paul's last letter that he wrote before he was executed. You see, Paul, he was imprisoned in Rome. This is the second time he was in prison. First time wasn't so bad. He was kind of on house arrest. He could have visitors. He had freedom. Second time, much worse. He's in chains. He's in shackles. He's in a dark, dank prison called Mammer Time, and he's about to be executed. It's just a holding cell before you get executed. But he's like, ah, oh, he's there and he's thinking. He's not thinking, oh, woe is me. My life is so hard. I'm about to die. He's thinking about others. He's thinking about his son, Timothy, his son in the faith, because he knows Timothy is going through some, some, going through some things too. You see, during that time, a lot of persecution was happening to the church. Nero had begun to persecute all Christians across the whole Roman Empire. You see, the city of Rome had caught on fire and Nero took it upon himself to blame it on the Christians. So everybody hated the Christians and they were killing them in great numbers. And Paul knew Timothy was a young pastor of the church in Ephesus and he knew that he was facing challenging times. So he's like, I got to stir Timothy up. And this is how he does it. He uses the prophetic voice. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You see, Paul, 
he does exactly what the Bible says. It says, we call the things as they are, even though they're not. Timothy probably wasn't even acting in faith right now. Maybe he was being timid or he was unsure. He was doubting. But Paul says, you know what? I know who you are. Timothy, let me remind you. I know who you are. I know the faith that is in you. Even if you don't feel it right now, I see it in you. I'm going to call it out. You're a man of God. Timothy, God has called you. It was in your mother. It was in your grandmother. And it's in you too. Don't let go of it. I'm going to remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you. Guess what? You online, the gift of God is in you. The gift of God is in me. But sometimes we got to stir it up. Sometimes it seems dormant. But we just got to say, oh God, I know you're there. I know you have a plan for me. Somebody may have to encourage you. You may have to encourage somebody. But if we do that, we're able to seize the moments that we're in. Maybe right now you're a Timothy. Maybe you're around people, but you feel alone. Maybe you're scared because of the circumstances you're in or you're doubting. You're not sure about the plan that God has for your life. Let me challenge you today. If you don't feel equipped enough to handle what's before you, God has a plan for your life. God sees the faith that is in you. You can stir yourself up. You can seize the moment because I am persuaded that with God, nothing is impossible. So maybe you're there, you're watching right now and you're saying, hey, I, I want to be stirred up. I want to live the life that God has called me to live, but I don't know Jesus. I don't know him as my personal savior. I haven't given my life to him. Let me tell you something. Right now is your moment. The very moment right now that you're in, that you're watching this, God is calling your name. He said, you know what? Your name is written in the book of life. You just need to accept me. You just need to come to know me. So if that's you, we're going to pray a prayer. All you have to do is say this with a sincere heart and believe it, and you will be set free. You will be born again. Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart and forgive me for my sins. I believe you died for me, and I believe you rose again. I want to be born again in my spirit. I want to live my life for you. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to live a victorious life. And with your help from this day forward, I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, this is the best day in your life. And we don't want it to slip by. So click on one of the links below and somebody's going to get in contact with you. Hey, and you know what? If this video touched you today, if this ministered to you, we want to encourage you to just do one thing. Just click that little share button so we can go out to somebody else and encourage their life. Hey, so we wanted to announce some Ladies Connect groups coming up. Sweet Life Conference is coming up. It's gonna be held in Modesto, California. It's gonna be awesome for the ladies. They can get strengthened, encouraged, built up for their unique call that God has in their lives. So from March 11th to 12th, the bus leaves at 9 a.m. So for more information, go ahead and click on the link below. Another connect group that I want to announce to you guys is the Student Ministries Connect Group, and it's called The Dining Room. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a time where the youth can come together and just understand what it's like to walk in a close relationship with Jesus. We're going to be doing a study called What Does It Mean to Be Chosen? It's based off of the Chosen TV series, and it's going to transform everybody into a close disciple of Christ. We're going to get to know Jesus on a personal level, and share meals together and grow in our faith. So that's going to be every Sunday at 11 a.m. starting on February 20th. So if you are a teen yourself or if you have, you're a parent and you have a teen and you want them to grow close in relationship with Jesus, this is the group for them. And we're so thankful for you givers online. We're so thankful for our giving team, for our tithers, for your generosity. And there's different ways that you can give. You can give online at crosswindsnv.org. Text to give is an awesome one. All you have to do is text to 84321. There's the mobile giving app. There's Secure Give. Or you can give in service. There's the drop boxes. You can also mail it to our address. So we're thankful for you givers. That's what helps the kingdom of God advance forward. You're faithful sowing and we can reap souls into the kingdom because of what you've done. All right, so here we are. We're at the end. We're going to do what we always do. We're going to make our statement of faith. So let's say it together. I am blessed. I have divine favor. I am not alone. I'm a child of God. I am more than a conqueror. I put my trust in the Lord. I walk in the promises of God's holy word because God has a miracle for me. 
Remember, Crosswinds, we're better together. God bless you.